Okay, now we're back for part B of our slideshow. Just to review, here is our example. And IV, DV, and EV, uh, as I said before, the IV is violent cartoons. The two conditions are violent or nonviolent cartoons, or the two levels are violent versus nonviolent cartoons. The dependent variable is aggressive acts. The extraneous variable is time of day. Now, you could say, and that you would be correct, that another extraneous variable are the participants, that is the students. Uh, however, since we randomly assign the students to conditions, no type, that is no special type of kid, is associated with either violent or nonviolent condition. And that's important because since there are no systematic differences or systemic differences between the kids in one condition versus another, we can say that we've controlled that. So, uh, talked about extraneous variables, now let's move on to talk about confound variables. Confound variable is an extraneous variable which co-varies with the levels of the independent variable. Uh, by co-vary, I mean one level of the independent variable is always associated with one level of the extraneous variable. And if we go back and look at the example, we see that one of my extraneous variables is also confounded. That is, the violent level of the IV, that is the violent level of cartoons, always occurs in the morning. And the morning is one level of the extraneous variable. The nonviolent level of the independent variable always occurs in the afternoon, and so then nonviolent is confounded with afternoon. Now, extraneous variables are neither good nor bad. Uh, and I spend about like three weeks in research methods explaining why they're good, then another three weeks explaining why they're bad, and then another three weeks explaining why they're good. Yeah, it's uh. January, but you know, the heat system here in my apartment is going crazy, so I have the window open, and for some reason a truck just drove by and, and slowed down in front of my house. I don't know why. But confounds are bad, okay? Uh, here's why. Let's say that we set something up like this, which we have uh, violent cartoons in the morning, then we observe uh, the students for 30 minutes, and we count the number of aggressive acts. Let's say, hypothetically, as an example, uh, in the morning the kids are sleepy. You know, they haven't really gotten up yet, so they're not going to be that active. And if they're not going to be that active, they're not going to be that aggressive. And so that may artificially depress the amount of aggressive acts in the morning. And that would show up just among the violent cartoons. So if we have a situation where in the morning the kids are more sleepy, uh, and in the afternoon they're more awake and more active, we may see equal levels of aggressiveness, not because violent cartoons have no effect, but because of this extraneous variable which is confounded. Uh, another uh, problem could be that uh, in the afternoon the kids are more hyper. They just had lunch, they had some grape drink with a lot of sugar in it or high fruct fructose uh, corn syrup. Uh, which makes them really uh, hyper. Uh, so uh, they're hyper and they're just going to be more aggressive. That would raise artificially the amount of aggressive acts among the nonviolent cartoon group. And so therefore, we may not see a difference between the violent group and the nonviolent group, not because violent cartoons have no effect, but because of this confound. Uh, another possible explanation, alternative explanation, uh, for this confound is that uh, in the morning the researcher who's counting the number of aggressive acts is alert. In the afternoon they're sleepy or they're uh, fatigued and they miss some of the uh, violent aggressive acts. So therefore, uh, you know, we may see that there's more aggressive acts in the morning, not because uh, the uh, you know students are more violent after watching the cart violent cartoons but because the researcher is more attentive in the morning. This is why confounds are just plain bad for an experiment.
Now that's uh, the main thing about IVs and DVs and the basics of experiments. There's a couple minor things I want to toss out, uh, toss in, uh, that I would like you to know. The first is about hypotheses. Uh, a hypothesis needs to be directional and it needs to be specific to the experiment. By directional, I mean which condition is doing better, which is doing worse. And by specific to the experiment, I mean you have to refer to the independent variable and the dependent variable. So a good hypothesis for our example would be participants in the violent cartoon condition will act more aggressively during free, free play time than participants in the non-violent car cartoon condition will act. It tells us who is doing more. Also, I refer to the, uh, you know, independent variable and dependent variable. Another topic is graphs. Uh, some students don't know how to read a graph, so let me just go over the basics. Uh, on the y-axis is the dependent variable. On the x-axis is the independent variable. So we can take a look at this and we can see that the dependent variable in this graph is the rating of the strength of the factor whatever that is. Uh, however, since you know this rule, you can figure out the names of the DVs and IVs just by looking at a graph, and that's what's important. Uh, the independent variable are participants, and the levels of that are Jewish and German. Now, also, you could put two independent variables in one graph, if that experiment does have two IVs, and this one does. And so then the levels of the second IV are listed in the legend. That is, that's the little box that uh, works as a key for the graph. And so we look in the legend and we see one level is external, the other is internal. We're talking about attributions here. Uh, and so that's how you can tell what the levels of the other variable are. And finally, a bar graph is done if the IV on the x-axis is non-continuous, that is, if it's different categories of things, Jewish versus German. Uh, a line graph would be used if the IV on the x-axis is continuous, that is, if uh, you know, there's no break between the different uh, levels, like if one level is 6 p.m., the other is 8 p.m., the other is 9 p.m., I ask you, is there such a thing as 8, 8.30 or something between 8 and 9? Yeah, 8.30. So that means it's continuous. Uh, when we're dealing with gender, male and female, that's uh, non-continuous, discontinuous. Like I always say, is there something halfway between male and female? No, not really. Replications and extensions I talk about a lot in terms of the assignment. And let me define these terms. An exact or a simple or a direct replication uh, is when the experiment is exactly recreated. Uh, you do the experiment over again. An extension or a conceptual replication uh, is where most of the study is replicated exactly, but one element might be changed or another element added. Uh, a very basic extension would be you change the population. The original study was done on Americans and you do it on Japanese people uh, for some theoretical reason. Uh, or you could do uh, change, you know, create an extension based on converging operations. Uh, converging operation is when you change the way one variable is operationally defined. You can take one variable and operationally define it in many different ways. Uh, I've mentioned that I chose to use Dragon Ball Z as my operational definition of a, you know, violent uh, cartoons. You could uh, take that uh, conceptual variable of violent, car violent cartoons or violent TV and operationalize it in a lot of different ways. So, depending upon the operation that you use, uh, that could be a very theoretically interesting uh, extension. And then a final way of developing an extension is by adding a new theoretically interesting va variable that is based on the theory you know that another variable should be added and this would uh, m you know, somehow uh, create more knowledge or more understanding of the phenomenon. And finally, I talk about valid independent and dependent variable operations. 
Uh, validity means whether the operational definition of your IV and DV will actually work as you expect. That is, uh, in our experiment, we say that uh, we're operationally defining a violent cartoon as watching five minutes of this episode of uh, Dragon Ball Z. How do I know that's really going to work? It's really going to have an effect on the uh, students, if there's anything. Well, usually the best way to go about doing this is try to find something that's been used in past studies and you can borrow a lot of different operational definitions from a lot of different studies for your study. And since they've been used before, you have a better chance than uh, not that that is going to be a valid operational definition which will actually do what you want to do. In fact, uh, I've helped a lot of students design studies that not just for class but for independent research and theses. And one of the problems in actually doing an experiment and getting it to work is just this, finding valid IVs and DVs. And I always encourage students to look for uh, operational definitions that have been used before. So these are some basic ideas in uh, you know, research that you'll need to know for social psych. Uh, thank you for listening. And here's Minalushi. I had Minalushi for about 20 years. She was a wonderful cat. And she would. one of the things she would do is something like this. My wife and I were working on this uh, jigsaw puzzle. And we uh, left it overnight. And when we came down in the morning, uh, she was saying, hey, listen, I'm the real cat here. All right, take care.